Hello gamers, Matt Lemke here at Gen Con 2012 with Matthew from uh, Mongoose. He's the CEO, correct? Uh, well, near enough. Yes. Near enough? <laughs> near enough? He's the boss. So we'll go ahead and we're going to talk to him about um, Mongoose's games and maybe what they have in store for us in the future a little bit. Uh, we're going to start with their RPG line. Uh, actually, we're going to start with Traveler because we were just chatting about it a little bit. And I really don't know a whole lot about Traveler. I know it's been there, and I don't really know anybody who plays it, but it has been around for as long as I can remember with oh, RPGs. Yeah. So what is the... Uh, but let's start with the basic background. Oh, well, the, uh, the core book doesn't really uh, have a background. It's, uh, if you think of it as the science fiction version of Dungeons and Dragons, it's all open for you to uh, create your own universe, and all the tools are in there to do that. Um, and then we, uh, we can supply you with a ready-made setting if, uh, if you don't want to go through that. So is it a D20 system or is it a multi-die system? No, it's a D6 system, uh, the one where we've got at the moment. Um, unified uh, task mechanic built into the game, so straight uh, 2D6 roll, get 8 or more to uh, succeed. Modifiers go on top of that. Easy, easy as that. And just recently you released, uh, well this year, I can remember four books for sure. What, what is the most recent? I think it was four. I seem to remember <laughs> posting about four. I could be posting old news. <laughs> well, we've just come out at um, uh, Gen Con with, uh, what is it, um, the Solomani Rim and Deneb Sector books. So that's two more right there. That makes six. <laughs> yeah, so, and, and those are basically like campaign books, or are they...? They're part of the Third Imperium setting, which is the um, official or original Traveller universe. Um, where you've got the, uh, the massive imperium and the alien um, uh, empires uh, surrounding it. Uh, and what we've been doing is steadily de detailing sector by sector uh, all of uh, charted space. Um, we've got, uh, what, six or seven sectors done so far, and I think there's something like 50 or 60 to go. <laughs> it's, it'll be a long-term project. Long-term, it's like yes. your grandson's job. <laughs> <laughs> And what edition are we on with Traveller now? Uh, well, we, we just call it Traveller ourselves, but um, uh, over the years since 1970-whatever, you've had uh, Traveller and Mega Traveller and uh, New Era, uh, T4, T5s... Um, uh, so they're not, really, they're not really new editions, they're more like... No, they, those, those all, all the ones I've mentioned have all had very different rule sets from one another. Uh, what we've done with our game is go back to the very first one, they what they call Classic Traveller now, um, and built on that system, um, streamlining it, updating it, uh, tweaking a few bits that um, uh, made sense in the 70s and 80s, that really makes make so much sense now. Uh, and that's the, uh, that's the game we've got. Oh, so you've updated like, the technology aspects of it too? Some of them, yes. Um, kind of like the growth of Star Trek. Uh, kind of the like, like no more glass with glitter and spinning it. <laughs> <laughs> True, yeah. Um, I mean the uh, the actual third Imperium setting we kept more or less the same as it uh, as it always has been, um, but we just made the, uh, the rules flow a lot better. For example, Traveller's is quite famous for its character creation. We start off with uh, an eighteen year old character and then go through blocks of four years generating their life path before you start adventuring. Oh, so those are kind of like their levels? Uh, sort of. We don't really get levels of experience in Travelers. It's, it's more about... So they're, um, they're tiers. Uh, they're like age tiers. It's like an 18-year-old nowadays would be in college. Yeah. So yes. he would have this skill set. Yes. And then when he comes out, he'd be an intern. And the intern would... But the thing with Traveller is um, you can choose your, um, which career you follow or you can get thrown out of that career and be forced to do something else. I've always said you've, uh, you can start off wanting to uh, join the army or be a colonial explorer or perhaps be the galaxy's greatest rock star if you want to. And from that point you watch as um, your life completely doesn't unfold as you. In the case of a rock star it just it falls apart. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you succeed. Um, but Traveller's always had that. What uh, we ended up um, adding was as well as uh, acquiring various skills and things as you uh, go through the character's life, 
we've added background events, so you're also building up the character's background. However, you can also tie those events to other player characters. So when you muster out and ready to play, uh, you already know each other, all your characters. We um, kind of describe it like the, uh, the crew from the Firefly, um, that they all, all knew each other, all had links to each other before the, uh, the series began. Um, and it's, it's kind of like that you're generating the crew of the Firefly. That's good. I like that. No, now we should uh, maybe move on into some movies a little bit. Mm -hmm. Let's start with Star Trek. I've been a Star Trek fan, gosh, as long as I can remember. And it's a tabletop game. Yeah. Uh, inches or centimeters? Inches. It's, uh, it's, 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 uh, that's that's God's, uh, God's way of playing war games, we've decided. It, it, seem, it seems to be the case. Uh, inches kind of makes sense, or centimeters kind of make sense for me for a spaceship game because it's so vast. Yeah, we have seen people switch to centimeters for um, uh, like six millimeter scale uh, ground Holy combat. Holy cow! Like, you can't even paint those. Oh yeah, you have like six or six or ten. Well, yeah, eight and yes. That's very pretty easy to paint. Just go like that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it, I'm guessing it's a D6 base also? It is D6 based. It uh, uses the same um, tweak tool system that we used for our Tools Arms Babylon 5 game uh, a few years oh, ago. Oh, yes, that's what's missing through the show that I didn't notice. <laughs> yes, I forgot about that game. Oh, I didn't really forget about it, but it's like I didn't notice it during the mm. show. Um, well, we can get into that maybe in, in a minute. Let's continue with Star Trek. The uh, Star Trek, from the looks of the ships, it looks like it's basically around the era of the original Star Trek si That's series. That's correct, yes. Uh, and you just released which fleet? Or which race? We started off with the Federation, the Klingons, and the Romulans, the big three, we call them. We've just brought the uh, Kazinti out, um, basically cat-like aliens that uh, like throwing drones and disruptors at you. Yes. We've got the um, Gorn coming out, um, uh, next month, which are the uh, lizard men that appeared in one episode where they were fighting on a, a dusty planet, throwing boxes. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. The doing. big gory yeah. guy, <laughs> that's what, dude that, that doesn't die. That's what the gore is. He, he made gunpowder out of powder. That's it. Stuff. Yes, yes, I know that episode. That was one um, of my favorite episodes as a child. And we've got some some ships from the smaller fleets, either already out or on their way. Things like the Pirates, Orion, Green, Skin Slave Girls. And um, uh, the Fogians as well. So how are you, you going to make the web one? Well, we just released, um, or about to release, some very basic ships. The web rules aren't in the game yet, but we've been playing around with them. Um, and what we're trying to set up is um, some sort of uh, uh, red trans translucent uh, resin that you can basically put on the um, table like um, fire like, up like, like when they fly by. Yeah. yeah. Now, is the game um, a true skirmish game, or is it more like a, a single ship type of? Uh, it's, we call it a fleet game. You can um, uh, go put one ship against one ship, but the game really begins to come alive when you've got four, six, eight, twelve, whatever ships. So the bigger the better? Oh yeah. And, uh, I saw, I think it was a Federation starter that caught my eye over there. How many ships are in there? About six? Um, in the, what well, we've got two basic sets for all the fleets, they get the squadron set, which has got uh, five ships in it. And then we've got the big fleet box, which has got 16 ships, six shuttles, and a free rule book. Okay, that's the, that's the box I saw, right? There's a lot of things in that. Oh, yeah. Um, so what, what are some of the unique highlights to the Star Trek game that would make people want to play it over other games that are already out there? <laughs> it's called Romulans, uh, Romulans and Klingons in. Well, it's, aside it's a big from the licensing <laughs> aspect of it, it's uh, very. Uh, the game is very quick and easy to pick up. The uh, the core rules of movement can be described in two paragraphs. Um, oh, wow, firing cool. weapons adds um, a couple of pages to that. What we do is make the core rules very very easy to grasp. Um, you learn them within five ten minutes of actually playing the game. Uh, you have them memorized. And what we do on top of that is add. Um, uh, layers of uh, special rules that kick in when you do certain actions or when you use certain ships. It's not stuff you have to remember all the time. Uh, you just quickly refer to it when you do something odd. Um, and we do that by adding um, special actions. You can um, get a, a ship to uh, 
uh, boosts its energy shield, uh, boosts its shields or uh, uses its tractor beams on uh, another ship. Um, and also by adding special rules to both ships and weapons. So a weapon might be super accurate, meaning you need a much lower number to uh, hit something. Or a ship could be really agile, which means it can turn 90 degrees instead of just 45. Um, just, just little tweaks like that, but they add layers to the game. Okay. And there's going to be a lot more tweaks. So when you have finished the original basic series, mm -hmm. are there plans on moving into some of the other Star Trek shows, or is it going to um, pretty much stay at this level? At the moment, our license covers um, uh, the Starfleet universe, which is uh, basically the original series. Um, if we did want to go to Next Gen or anything, that would require us uh, negotiating a new license, license, which is possible. Um, but frankly, there's more than enough to keep us occupied for a few years. So, so yeah, we're doing yeah. <laughs> and, and you seem to be really good at getting licenses. So we we certainly have been in the past. Um, these days. <laughs> Even today, we're still looking at um, uh, some new licenses, but we do want to start concentrating on our own properties as well. Because um, whenever you take a license out, you always have to give 10% to someone else. Oh, that's a lot less than I thought, actually. It well, there's can, probably can a, be higher. There, well, there's probably a charge too, like a flat charge right off the bat. Too. What you normally pay is an advance, um, okay. which is against those rules. It's kind of like writing. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's just like that. It's not you don't. It, there's not actually a license fee, but um, I say the, the advance can be very, very steep. Um, I would imagine, especially it probably varies from license to license too. It does, and um, sometimes there are bargains out there. Um, I mean, you can pick up some um, very well-known properties for. Um, I think uh, at least we paid something like that, something like ten thousand dollars advance, which is very reasonable. Um, right up to something like Starship Troopers, where they start looking for six figures as an advance, and that's quite, what? That's quite frightening. Say what? Please check out everything. That's, that's, <laughs> that's a lot. I, and, I mean, that's that doesn't seem like a license to me that should be bigger than Star Trek. So that 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 would be frightening. Well, see, it all depends um, who you're approaching. Um, all the different film studios out there all have seem to have a certain minimum. Um, and you begin oh. working out who's got uh, what minimum, okay. um, and which which studio property is with um, will probably determine what you're paying out to begin with. Like um, Sasha Troopers was with Sony, and they uh, asked for a lot of money. Did not know it was Sony. Interesting. Interesting. So then you go with Babylon Five, Warner Brothers. You're still paying an eye-watering yeah. amount, but it's not that much. <laughs> It seems like, yeah, Warner Brothers is a pretty big name. They, they would probably be like, oh, it's our name too, so let's make sure they want to invest their time. And, and that, that's how I kind of see that. Yeah. It's, it's like, well, let's see how serious they are. Well, that's pretty much. I mean, if somebody comes on and pops on the table, yes, we're prepared to uh, uh, pay this many tens of thousands of dollars. Um, uh, you know they're serious. And so right. Start going exactly. To the next stage. Exactly. You know they're serious. So we're going to move on to Judge Dredd, and then we're going to come back to what your plans might be for your own miniatures on. No problem. Um, Judge Dredd's been out for, I'm going to guess, I caught wind of it probably May-ish of last year, so I'm going to guess it's been out for about two years now. Um, huh. Maybe a little longer? I, I, like Judge, I said, I was removed well, for a while. Like we've got a bit of history with this. Judge Dredd was actually the first licensed game we ever produced, uh, way oh. back in... Okay. I meant the new one. The one I know, I know. So I can just think back, way back in 2001, 2002, we did a D20 version of Judge Dredd. Um, I say, uh, it must be three, four years ago, we did um, the Traveller version, which is the uh, purple covered uh, book we've uh, got. Can any of that stuff left? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, cool. it's, it's still, still going strong. Um, and the miniatures game, we did. Um, just a miniatures game called Gangs Make City One. A fair few years ago, we did it as a box set. Uh, the Just Red Miniatures game of today has um, a full rule book that is free to download. Oh, cool! Um, and we've got uh, little thirty-dollar box sets. Each one has basically got one faction ready to play. Um, it's a very easy game to to, to get into. D six base. Uh, 
28 millimeter, right? D10, true, true D, D10, D10 base, actually. Oh, um, cool. Uh, I like D10. It, it, it was always going to be D6 base, but some wins you get to go to D10 on that. <laughs> I like D10. Ever since I played, gosh, I don't know. First mini game I ever played was Mage Knight. Mm -hmm. And then we moved on, and we were thinking about 40k, and somebody came, no, let's play Void. We played Void. Right, right, right. I really fell in love with D10 based systems <laughs> after that. Um, so, do you, I'm thinking about the Judge Dredd movie. I, I don't know a whole lot about the comic book. It's been a, quite a few years mm -hmm. since I've read anything Judge Dredd like. And even then, it was only like four or five issues of a special sure. kind of thing. Um, so, it seems like it would be character heavy. Is your game character heavy? It can be. What we do is, um, uh, I quite like this mechanic, we basically split games down into heroes and minions. Um, and the heroes are the ones you're, you're concentrating on. They're the ones earning experience, getting all the cool kit. Then you've got the minions that you don't really care about to the extent that they get automatically replaced at the end of every game that they die anyway. Um, but you've always got the chance that um, if a minion survives, I think it's five games, they get to be a hero. Oh, cool. That's kind of neat. So, it's a campaign type of game. So oh, yeah. That's it's, it's, not, it's not like, okay, let's go play a tournament type of thing. It's a you can run it as a tournament, and you can have um, the, the, quick, uh, quick setup games, but we, we kind of encourage people to uh, get, get a gang or uh, judge force. So, it, it's in. kind of almost an RPG game. If you set up a campaign right, mm -hmm. and this is... Chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, chapter five. You certainly can do. You can have, um, uh, if anybody volunteers for it, you could have uh, someone putting a newsletter together, like a Main City One type of newspaper, with all the latest events of the campaign, who hates who, who's beating who. That sounds like a lot of fun. That does. So, for the police, you have like your judge dread character, or your judges. The judges, yeah. And then you have like all the judges in training, so that would be like the judges are like the heroes and the police in training. Uh, uh, minions, rookies, and cadets. Yes. Uh, I mean, judges go through um, a fifteen-year training period. They they start off as children, so we've got um, the little kids in judge uniforms with their white helmets on, um, and they're, they're just cadets. You've got the rookies who aren't proper judges yet, but almost, and then you've got the proper street judges. Um, and from then on, you've got all the um, specialist kind of judges that work in like the med division or tech division, uh, side division, you've got psychic powers. Um, uh, there, there's a big variety of judges. So, let's see, there's, 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 how many minis are currently in the line, roughly? No idea. Uh, lots. Over, uh, over 100? Uh, Joe, it's probably not quite that many. We're, we're probably floating around the 80 odd mark at the moment. Okay. Um, but Joe, we've just added. Um, some Britsit judges. Um, and you're going to add something soon. You showed me pictures. The uh, Prowl Tank. Yeah, the Prowl Tank. Yeah, but we've been talking about this for about a year now, and it looks like we're going to make some final tweaks for it and put it into production in the next month or so. Uh, Manta Prowl Tank, big resin hopper tank, about so big. About That's about so 16 big. inches. Yeah. Um, uh, and that's a, a real house of a vehicle in the game. And it's going to be all resin, right? It will, yes. Maybe with a few metal detail parts for the guns and what have you. I'm pretty excited about that. So, I'm not actually, actually sure when the new Judge Dredd movie comes out. It's next month. Um, are you doing anything in tandem for it? We are. We've got a few promotions um, going through to the um, retail side. We'll probably make them available on our website as well. Basically, if you... Um, uh, want to equip your uh, game circle or club um, with enough to uh, kick off a, a Judge Dredd campaign, be it RPG or miniatures, um, we'll make sure it's quite cheap for you to do so. Um, uh, and as I said, we've got some uh, new releases coming out with like the Manta Power Tank and Brits and Judges and what have you. About. I lost my train of thought. About, I think about what I was going to say. <laughs> oh! The bikes, the, the big, the judge bikes, are they, have they been made yet? We've, um, we've done two versions in the past and I've never been happy with uh, either, uh, completely happy with either of them. We've, we're just about to get um, 
a new sculpt from XGW guy, uh, Gary Morley, who's done a beautiful Lawmaster. Um, it's got all the right details on, all the right proportions. Um, that we're going to have um, different types of riders on there. So if you want a street judge or a female judge, not a problem. If you want one of the specialist uh, tech guys, you put a tech, you'll have a tech judge on there, and the bike will have tech bits added to it that we've not quite worked out yet. Um, but no, that's uh, coming very soon. It's, it's going to be a very sweet model. Now you've mentioned earlier that you're toying with your own game lines. Yes. Where? Do you kind of plan on starting? What do you see? Are you going to go back to fantasy? Are you going to stay sci-fi? Oddly enough, the first new one, or new run you'll see from us, will be historical. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to be releasing a range of miniatures for Victory at Sea, which is our World War II naval game. Um, 1800 scale, so they're going to be about uh, battleship about so long. Very highly detailed, all 3D design. Candy bar size. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but we're putting a lot of work into, into this line. Our basic aim is to have a model for everything that ever floated in World War II. Now, that's Whoa. not going to come out at once. We're thinking that's going to be three, four years. We'll get around to... That's a lot of different ships. It because is. Because the Japanese just kind of took stuff and threw metal on it. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> we've got a big um, post drop in our office with all the fleets running along at the top and then all the ships that we want to do running down. You start looking at the French and German fleets, you think, yeah, that's a, a block about so big, that's, that's uh, almost doable. Yeah, yeah. Then you get to the uh, Royal Navy or the US Navy, yeah, they're just all the way down to the floor. <laughs> um, what's making it worse is um, because we're doing all these in 3D, it's very easy for us to do uh, variants of a ship. So we're not just going to do a ship for the Iowa class, say. We'll do a separate ship for the, uh, like the Wisconsin and the Missouri. Okay. We can go into greater detail than that. We can do, say, an Iowa in, as it appeared in 1942, and another one, as it appeared in 1945, when it's had all sorts of refits and what have you. Yeah, because it, have it was refitted sort of, during the war, oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, the Enterprise had, like, eight. But we're trying to stack as many anti-aircraft guns as possible on them. Um, but yes, that's, uh, so we can have multiple models for one ship, but that's fairly easy for us to produce. Now, not everyone's going to want that level of detail, right, right. but it's there if they do. That's pretty cool. Um, so we're going down to things like motor torpedo boats. We're going to have uh, all the aircraft in there as well. Um, it's, uh, it's a lot of work. We've done about 60 different ships so far, um, the first of which will appear in four, four six weeks' time as a box set, uh, Battle of the River Plate, which for, um, uh, for a few Americans is the uh, first major naval engagement of the war uh, when the British went after one of Germany's popular battleships. Yeah, I don't remember talking about that. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get into the interesting that's stuff later we were, on. That's before we were involved. <laughs> uh, so after that, what's your uh, next game? We've got one coming out called um, Blue Shift, which is a space fighter combat game. Uh, basically, it's um, another campaign-based game. You take command of a squadron of mercenary space fighters and go off searching for contracts. Um, because you've built up your squadron, your fighters all need maintaining, your pilots need paying. Um, and it's kind of a balance between being good at dogfighting on the tabletop and being able to run a business and not go bust when you've um, finished playing. Violent monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> We've um, made the rule system very, very free to play. It's really um, about, uh, there's no pre plotted movements, it's all about seat of pants flying. Um, if you've got five or six fighters on the table, you'll go through a turn in four or five minutes at the most. It really is quick. Punch by the good, here, fire kind of thing. How big are those ships going to be, roughly? Uh, three to four inches uh, across wingspan, maybe the same length. But um, what we've done is uh, made all the weapons detachable, all like the gun pods and the uh, missiles under the wings, or on top of the wings as it may be. Lots of magnets. So you can, yeah, you can do. So you can um, basically equip the fighter um, as you see fit, or as far as you can afford. Or refit it. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> okay, good, good. And when do you think you'll be getting those minis into production? 
Uh, the back line uh, blue shift is already written, it's being laid out now, the models have already been created, they're about to go to prototype. Um, so you, you watch, oh, you, you might see it uh, as early as January. Oh, cool. Cool. Okay, I think it pretty much got, yeah, well, let's ask the, the deadly question, what do you want to share? <laughs> <laughs> It's not what can he share, it's what does he want to share. Well, something's just cropped up at this show. Um, it doesn't really have a name yet. We released for the um, Legend RPG, um, in conjunction with a company called On The Land Games, a setting called Historia Rodentia, which is basically 19th century colonial warfare, Napoleonic warfare, um, and intrigue, but with animals. So the British are cats and dogs, the French are ferrets and uh, mongooses, um, and it's an astronomorphic uh, uh, setting, basically. Now, we always talked about doing a miniatures game for that, based on the Sasha Troopers rules. Okay. Um, and the rule book has been, they, they started writing the rule book, and we've been starting to think about uh, how to do uh, miniatures for that line. But we had a conversation here at Gen Con, and I think we more or less decided that it would be way cooler if we advanced the timeline 100 odd years and basically do a Second World War version um, uh, as a miniatures game. Very so nice. you've got the tanks, you've got um, the British cats and dogs fighting against um, uh, the Germans are uh, uh, traders of uh, gerbils and mice and things like that with their steel hats and trench coats. We, they've already done a couple of mock sketches. A little Prussian hat with the spray. Yeah. That's cool. Um, in, the, uh, in the African desert, uh, the desert fox will actually be a fox. Um, and uh, I'm just starting to do um, ferrets for the uh, resistance in France. <laughs> Excellent. That sounds cool. Uh -huh. That's probably. A good distance from it could be coming as, to maturity. It could be as early as uh, this time next year, um, yeah, but we have business. not set uh, a release date for it. We haven't even settled on a name for it yet. We keep um, the two things suggested is um, uh, World War Claw or uh, Baton Creek. But it might, it might not be any of those. We, we really don't know. <laughs> I can't, that's catchy. Rats and Creek. Oh, the, the trouble is actually means um, uh, a type of fighting that was taking place in uh, Stalingrad. Um, so maybe we'll stick that name in work. We don't know yet. We really don't know. Well, thanks, Matt. It was, it was a good chat. It was, I had fun. I learned a lot about your games. And, you know, being in Ohio, I don't see you around a lot in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, pretty much in our area, it's Magic the Gathering, a handful of board games. Dungeons and Dragons, Pathfinder, and 4K. Yeah. Because, why, I don't really know, because I never see anybody playing. Well, I see everybody playing Magic the Gathering. And occasionally I see people playing board games, but I never see anybody well, play positive, the minis. Well, positive fact is the economy at the moment. Nobody wants to take um, uh, risk on anything, so it, it can be hard for some more come with this, but um, uh, we've got the internet and we've got very big voice. And, and that, that is part of it. Because a lot of the 40k players, they don't play in the store in our area. They play at home. Yeah. They're like, they're, they're like Dungeons and Dragons players. They play in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you, listeners. Matt Lemke with Matthew Sprang. Close enough. <laughs> Sprang. Like, Sprang like strange. Uh, from Gen Con 2012, talking about his products. Have a good day.